right, if you have your Bibles with you, you can be turning to Isaiah, Isaiah 61. And while you're turning that way, we did get a thank you card uh, from a uh, brother we sent uh, money, uh, the Hilly family, that we're going to the Philippine Islands. And uh, so I'll put that back there on the board uh, uh, for you to review. And uh, it was a very good trip from what he's told me and um, well worth it. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 61, beginning in the very first verse. Isaiah 61, in the first verse, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort and all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. The planning of the Lord might be glorified. And they shall build the old places, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities and the, de and the desolation of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen, and your vine dress and your vine dressers, but ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of your God, and ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. In their glory shall you boast yourselves. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness and watch care to New Testament Baptist Church. Lord, in the day which we live, we pray that you would continue to strengthen us. Lord, we pray that you would add numbers to our encouragement, people that you would want here and not we ourselves. God, we pray for those that do meet faithfully, Lord, that you would bless them greatly with your word. We'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, Isaiah uh, begins... Uh, identifying some of his messages and sometimes in many of the Israelites and that ended up being Isaiah's demise uh, viewed his preaching very very harsh they did not take encouragement in him uh, it did not impact their lives but uh, in Isaiah 61 Isaiah begins to qualify what his messages are about and what the purpose of his messages are and why instead of being angry that the uh that the nation of israel should receive them gl gladly first and for foremost the bible says the spirit of the lord god is upon me now uh more and more i see people uh uh and I'm talking about people uh, supposedly of our kind teaching a general call to preach. I believe in this uh, verse you will find quite the contrary, that he said the Spirit of God is upon me individually. He's called me to do this. Uh, I've, I've heard very well-known uh, preachers say there's a general call to preach, but you remember this, when I'm gone, that there is no more a general call to preach than there is a general call to redemption. Uh, if, if redemption and salvation is specific, certainly it is, uh, the, the call to preach the gospel is very specific as well. And uh, uh, be very cautious of men that, that look on it as a profession or a means to, to make a living because that is not what preaching is about. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, if we see that and we believe that, certainly we should listen to the message. Now, again, if you'll follow Isaiah's whole book, it wasn't necessarily encouraging, but what qualifies it that it came from God. 
It doesn't mean if it's pleasant. It doesn't mean that if it boosts you up or you're at, it came from God, and therefore it is needful for God's people. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord have anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Now, I want you to see that he, he begins to qualify, I'm preaching good things to the people who are down. I'm preaching good things to the people that are discouraged. Now, in the day of Isaiah, it was before the, the collapse of the nation, but it was very, very near. And he was warning them, if you do not comply, if you do not honor God, this nation will be no more. And well, Isaiah could preach that in the nation where we live today. Uh, there's a lack of honoring God like I have never seen in the previous years of my life. We were watching a video Adam had on his phone. Uh, and, 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 the, and the enemy is so stupid today, and yet you have thousands upon millions following stuff that doesn't even make sense. That's the day which we live. And, and so we find that Isaiah says, I'm here to help the meek with that. I'm here to encourage them where they're at. He, meaning the Lord God, had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, uh, every one of us has experienced that sometime in our life when our heart is so broken that we seemingly cannot continue. Now, the only balm for that, the only repair for that is the Word of God anointed by the Holy Ghost. That will send mending. That will send encouragement. That will make you feel like keep going when you'd rather quit. And that's what Israel needed in this day. But the sad truth is they didn't even know they needed it. Yeah. They, they thought that they were doing okay. And so... Uh, Isaiah qualifies his ministry as a ministry of encouragement and not hatred. And so he says, I'm here to bind you up, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, if you don't remember anything else about this message, listen, there's liberty to be had for the captives. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. There's liberty to be had for those that are, that are bound heavily in sin, and that is to trust, to put your confidence in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here where they were about to literally be bound in hands, bound hand and foot in chains and walked away, there's liberty even in that. Uh, we must praise the Lord. The opening of the prison to them that are bound. You know, uh, we as the Lord's people are not a bound people. We're not, we're not fettered, but sometimes we act like we are. We act like we're limited. We act like there's nothing left to be done. Uh, shame on us. Do we serve the God of the Bible or do we not? Uh, they, we are not a fettered people. We are a free people. We are a strong people. We are a people that, that, that is uh, trusted with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should be the very ones delving it out to whoever will listen and whenever they'll listen. And, and so we find that that is, the, that is the reminder that Isaiah gives Israel. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And you're like, well, what does that mean? What's acceptable? Well, that, that claiming the, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in, in New Testament times is simply this. The Lord's coming. Mm -hmm. The Lord is near. The Lord is near even at hand. Uh, trust the gospel. Look unto Christ as your Savior because this thing is very minutely short and he is soon, soon coming. That is the year of the Lord. Listen, it's a reality. It's coming. It's nearer now than it's ever, ever been before. And we, mu we, we must continue to preach until the Lord comes. There, there's, there's no quitting place. There's no option to be done because of the Lord. And so we find that is what we are to preach. Then he says the acceptable year of the Lord. That's for the redeemed. And then notice the very 
next part, not even a full sentence, <laughs> and the day of the vengeance of our God. So we have the acceptable year of the Lord, and we're to preach that it, it is now, and then immediately after that, the year of vengeance. You know, <clears throat> if you're outside the Lord's grace, vengeance is constant. Very, very, very clearly. If you don't know him, if you don't stand in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, his vengeance will be upon you. And we have, we have muttered down God to, to, uh, to most people. He's wanting you to do something. And he's twisting his hands and, and can't believe how this world is. No, no, he's sovereign. He spoke it. It's still under God's control at all times. And he's, he's going to discipline it because it belongs to him. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so uh, we find that um, Isaiah gives them this and wants them to understand, serve the Lord now. And if you don't, vengeance is coming. Notice that to comfort all that mourn. Now, how can it be a comfort to see vengeance poured out? Well, I'll name a few to you that'll be a comfort to me. Uh, Marilyn O'Hare, it'll be a great comfort to me when she stands before the Almighty and answers justly for what she done. That'll be a comfort to me. Um, when Adolf Hitler is, ju is judged righteously before the Almighty, that will be a very wonderful, marvelous day. Uh, you know, we, uh, we in the flesh can't see that yet. No. And it seems almost self selfish. But we'll rejoice in that day because this flesh will be set aside. Mm -hmm. See, we'll stand with the redeemed and, and having the likeness of, si uh, of the sinless Christ, we'll know all his ways are correct. And we'll be glad in it. And he said, that day, that day is coming. That day is near at hand. To comfort, the last of that verse, verse 2, to comfort all that mourn. Now, you can, you can kind of put yourself in that situation. We've all lost loved ones. And, and to mourn, what necessarily must happen for us to mourn? Something or someone must die, right? That, that, that's a, a prerequisite to mourning is something or someone dying. And, and what Isaiah was telling those people, listen, Israel's going to die. Israel's going to be a nation no more. And we're there, and, and we're to be there to comfort. Can you imagine, can you imagine giving the gospel to someone for the very last time? And then see them die. There, there's more mourning to that, is it not? There, uh, to me, death is much sharper when there's there, there's no expectation that you'll ever see them again. And so we find that uh, Isaiah says we need to be that comfort. We need to be there. We need to understand. I'm here to proclaim this to you. Verse three. To appoint them that mourn in Zion or Israel or Jerusalem to give unto the beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning. Now, I want you to see the, the beauty of ash, the ashes is the sacrifices that they did when they burnt their sacraments and it went up to glory. The ashes to make to, uh, that remained and they did different things with those depending on what sacrifice it was. But he says here, Isaiah says, I'm here to turn that into joy. I, I'm here to turn that into goodness. I'm here to turn that mournful spirit into a happy spirit, to joy. We, uh, you, you, you know what? All the law did was make us understand how sinful we really are. It was simply a schoolmaster. Nothing more, nothing more. And here he says, I'm here to transform that into joy. And the glory, how, how, <laughs> understanding how sinful and wretched we are 
and the only remedy being Christ, that's joyful. But, but look around today, and, and when you get a chance out, out in the community, out in the other of the Lord's churches, and show me the people that are joyful. I bet they'll fit on one hand. Remember, remember what Moses, uh, excuse me, Abraham said, if perhaps there be 50. If maybe there's 40. What about 30? And he got her down, and the Almighty said, if it's 10. <laughs> and you know why? Because he knew exactly who was there. Really, only Lot was saved. He brought out them girls, but it's, it's just like dragging lost children to the church. Besides hearing the gospel, it don't do them a whole lot of good, right? And them girls came out and proved dead well who they were. And so he, he brought them out. And, and, and so we find them, if our joy is not there, and obviously Israel had no joy about the messages of Isaiah, where is it? Where is the joy? We know it's the second fruit of the Spirit, right? So, where is it gone? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? And, and, and why do they not have it if they don't? And I believe it's really because we're so bogged down today with what the world says joy is. Amen. Listen, joy is not having joy. Things, because this is what th this this flesh is insatiable. That means it cannot be satisfied. It will never be satisfied. It, it, if you got if you get one Cadillac, you want two. If you get a five bedroom, you want a six. If you got a house with one pool, you want one with a sauna and two pools. You cannot satisfy this flesh, yeah. none whatsoever. So that's why. Getting joy from the world will do you no good. That's one place joy has gone, is looking in the wrong place. The other thing about joy is uh, maybe we give it away. Maybe not, not, not that, you know, uh, the devil stole my joy. I've heard my mother's pastor say that one time. I'm like, no, you probably give it to him. Right? Joy. That was one of the purposes of Isaiah's ministry in a very dark day was to trade these ashes out, death, uh, uh, the symbol of sin, for joy that they should already have. Joy for mourning. The garment of praise of the spirit, uh, 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 for the spirit of heaviness. Do you not believe there's a spirit of heaviness around today? Yeah. He says, I want to trade that out with you. I, 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 want, to give you I want to give you joy for the, the sense of melancholy, this heaviness, this thing that is dragging you down. And, you know, th th this is the wonderful truth. He can do it. Now, clever preachers can't do it, but God can do it. Uh, God is able. Uh, and we see that that that's his desire for us, is, is to be happy. Joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness. Now, you think about yourself, and do you think you could be defined or declared or uh, looked at as a tree of righteousness? How do you know what a tree of righteousness looks like? What is this little tree at the end of the driveway? Right there. It's a peach tree, right? How do I know that? It's got peaches on it, right? Not, not rocket science. And, and so we, we, we see here, how do you know that a tree is righteous? What is it putting out? Well, what is it bearing? And that doesn't mean, you know, listen, and, and y'all know I believe it, but listen, that ain't just wearing skirts all around all the time and breeches to your ankles. That's being kind to others. 
that's showing earnest concern. Not only about their soul, is there something I can help you with? Is there something I can do for you? Is there any, th any way that I can make your burden a little lighter? That's true fruits of righteousness. Of, uh, of being the testimony when there is it, when there is none. So the next time you go uh, by a tree, what's, what's it got on it? What's present there? What, what sets it apart? And, um, you know, down at the creek at the house, there's a huge sycamore tree. And half the roots, it's right on the creek bank, and the roots float in this way and go back into the creek. Now, that old big sycamore, uh, what do you think might happen to it one day? Now, I trust its roots are strong enough, but listen, I've seen, I've seen that creek run over the bridge to our house. And uh, very realistic possibility, if it's not real well rooted, that sycamore will go down and it'll fall into the creek one day. So we find here, as Isaiah is writing, we really need to look within ourselves and see, it, see how well rooted we are and see if the righteousness is present. Notice this, the planting of the Lord that it might, that he might be glorified. Now that gets us back to the question of these truths, the, the, these roots of righteousness, who planted you? Who planted you? And, and I know how difficult it can be sometimes and how easy seemingly in the flesh it would be to get one of these little ones to repeat a prayer after me, but if you did that, where would their roots be? What, what good would it do them 50 years from now? Nothing. Because there's no roots. And what little root there is, it's in himself. Remember the parable of the sower? Made that very clear. It says that they came up, they sprung up, they did good for a while, and then they dried up. Why? Because they had no tap root. Mm -hmm. They, they had, had nothing enduring that would last. And, and, and so it is many times today. So as Isaiah is writing to the church, he says, or to the nation of Israel, he says, I'm trying to encourage you. Verse 4, and they shall build the old places. Uh, we need that today. Now, literally what Isaiah wanted was that the temple, well, they weren't down yet, but they were about to be down. And uh, you ever thought why the temple was let to go? And I really believe it's this, to show this, this is not your God. Your God's up here. And they built it a second time, and it was never, never as luxurious or beautiful as it was the first time. And then it too went down. And so uh, we, need, we need to really have our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, do we not? Uh, things, th things, are, things here are very, very temporal. And sometimes our joy is stolen because we forget that. And we think, oh, it should be like this, and it should be like this. No, no. It needs to be on the ways that the Lord wants it to be. And they shall build the old ways. When we have energy from the Lord God, when, when we're in His will, it can be done. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste city and the desolations of many, many generations. Now, what a glorious thing when we have joy, we can build back the old places. And listen, uh, and I'm not talking about the temple of Jerusalem, the old places where God's men of years ago abided in the word of God. Very satisfied with buildings that were caving in around them, but having the presence of the Almighty. That's what concerned them. That's what they wanted. And uh, he says, you can have that again. You, you can possess that once again. You can live in that once again if you want to. So how's your joy? Where is that presence? He gives them a promise in verse 5. The stranger shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowsmen. 
and your vine dressers. Now, he continues their promise, and this was again for national Israel. He says, if you have joy, if you're in the will of God, your very enemy will be the one that is doing the work in your fields. That's a rich promise, is it not? We, we, we really get down and discouraged, and what we need is to simply remember we are serving the mighty God of the Bible. And, and, and we need to we need to serve him like we mean it. We need to we, we need to put heart and soul into it. Not 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 feel that God should be glad that you came down to the house of God, but find a privilege in coming to the house of God and be glorious in what he's given you. Give him praise, give him glory, even where you're at. And he makes them that promise. The very ones you think are your enemy are going to serve you. But ye shall be named. Now they won't, they won't no longer going to be the, the flocksmen and the vine dressers. But ye shall be the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. You're going to be the leaders. Verse 7. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their, po in their portion. They again were going to be doubly blessed for how they lived if they, if they followed his design. Therefore in their land shall, uh, therefore in their land they shall possess the devil everlasting joy unto them. And now we see a, 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 a distinct switch here and the Gentiles began to get encouragement. And he says, the joy is going to be with them. People, even if your Bible is laid out this way, even the first verse in many Bibles, there will be a star at that verse predicting the coming of Christ. And here we find a, a sound predict, prediction not only will Israel be joyful, we'll be joyful. We will be the happy ones. We will be the glad ones. You ever think back in the day the Lord saved you and how thrilled and happy you were when the Lord saved you? Uh, don't ever let that slide. Don't, don't ever let that just uh, slip into the background because that's the joy Really, we ought to live in on an everyday basis. The joy will come to the Gentiles. For I, the Lord, love judgment. Now, that can be looked at in a lot of ways. Number one, he does love judgment. He, uh, he loves and, and is excited about the thought of saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in into the glory of the Lord. He loves that kind of judgment. He also loves this. He told the churches of Galatia, You did run, you did run well. Who did bewitch ye that ye may believe a lie? You know what that is? That's judgment. It's giving them, Hey, this is wrong, and this is the direction you need to go. Uh, people don't like that today anymore, do they? They, they? There is no one that wants to be told that they're incorrect. And you know what? Our crazy public school system, they encourage that. No one's wrong and everyone's right. You, you know what that takes away from a society? What's absolute? You know, despite what, men, what mankind says... There is an absolute authority, and it belongs unto God. He, he, he is, and, and so as the as the writer Isaiah is writing, he said he, he he gives us great encouragement. For I, the Lord, love judgment. He loves correcting us, and if he don't give us the blessing. If, if we don't receive the correction, 
Then the lion's to find on judgment is this, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. See, that's, that's another judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. Now again, talking about the temple, that would be like going stealing some someone else's two turtle doves and placing them on the altar for you. But in a spiritual sense, listen, uh, don't pretend. <laughs> if you don't have joy, the very best thing is you just admit it, right? The very best thing you can do, and, and, and then pray for it. Uh, you know what? What I found with people like that, you always have to one up them. If they're shouting the aisles this Sunday, they'll have to be rolling in the floor next Sunday. It's always something to one up them and make it better and better. And, and, and you know what? Those things fizzle out, do they not? Very, very quickly. And, and, and so you can you can be you are the only true judge of your joy. Are you happy? Are you glad? Or are you not? And I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery. I will direct their work in truth. What a rich promise. I will direct their work. Uh, I will guide them. I will be their leader. I will, I, I, I'll be the one that, that, that's first in the path. Well, you know, what, what a rich, wonderful promise. If we are joyful, we're ensured of the leadership of the Almighty. And certainly we can believe the next is true if we're miserable and down and out and downtrodden, as the Bible says. How do we look for joy? How do we look for his guidance in that? His guidance, his leadership is promised to the joyful. Promised to those that love him. Those that are rejoicing in his presence. So we certainly have to believe if that if it's not present, then we have no real leadership from the Almighty. That uh, what we're doing pretty much a waste of time. So where is our joy in this? Notice this at the end of verse. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be among the Gentiles. And their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them. And they, that they are the blessed seed which the Lord have blessed. You ever thought about the day of acknowledgement? We, uh, we very often preach and, and think of the promise that the Lord God gives us where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that huh, you are king. We think about the God-haters of this century and past centuries, how that they will be included in that number and they will bow down and they will give him glory and they will give him honor. But have you ever thought about what a, what a glorious thing it's going to be for, uh, for, the, for him to acknowledge us, to say he's mine, she's mine, they belong to me. Have you ever thought of the glory of acknowledging that? Before his feet, we will do that very thing. The Lord has blessed us in that way. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Now, if you underline in your Bible, that's where your joy will come from. I greatly rejoice in the Lord. Now, if you have flimsy joy or flimsy trust or shallow peace, uh, the first good storm that comes by, you'll be standing there with an empty basket. But if you're well planted in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've genuinely been born again and you're deep-rooted, joy, joy will be part of what you live in. 
Joy will be part of your daily, your daily thing. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Now, are you going to always rejoice in my preaching? Most certainly not. Are you going to always rejoice in singing? Most certainly not. Are you going to feel like a million bucks every day and feel like you're 16 again? Absolutely not. But you can rejoice in the Lord. You can be glorified in Him. You can be encouraged in Him. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Now, uh, you, ever, you ever heard about, or you seen, I know you have people kind of putting on airs, is what my grandmother called it, kind of pretend to be something that they're not. I had a dear, dear aunt, Aunt Lena Douglas Chadwick. She married my grandmother's youngest brother. Sweet, sweet lady. But, and I probably would have done the same thing, maybe I'm, I'm a little proud too, but her name was Lener, L-E-A-N-E-R. But when she got to Granite City, she changed, she changed it to Lena. And I always knew her as Aunt Lena, but it was really Aunt Lena. And you know what? But did that change who she was? No, no. <laughs> She was still the same person, right? But she was pretending to be something she wasn't. There's no joy in that. There's no happiness in that. And it will soon play out. It, it, it will soon lose its energy and, and the, ability, uh, the, uh, the ability to do that. And so real joy is a must. Notice this, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me in the garments of salvation. Are you saved? Is that, is that not the key, the kingpin? Everything else uh, swings on the one thing. He clothed us in salvation. If you're born again, that, that is your joy. When this life is done, you may not... Fill a million, like a million bucks every day and walk in the pews. But listen, we're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our joy. Don't pretend to have something you don't. Yeah. And I see a lot of that as days go by. He clothed us in the garments of salvation. He covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked himself for or with, with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Now, that's significant. It's because those garments are made by other people. Those garments, in other words, the, the tuxedo, and that's what we wear in the States for weddings, you didn't make it yourself. You either bought it or someone bought it for you. See, what you're robed in, the Lord Jesus Christ bought himself. Very dear, dear and fatal price, but he bought it himself. We're clothed in that. And you know what? We should be identifiable by that. By how we present, how we talk to others, the encouragement we give or we don't give. That, that's our garment. Ever think that you may have misused that garment yourself? Not being quite genuine about it, not being maybe completely forthright, forthright about it. That's who we are. That, th th this is what he's given to us. Verse 11. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and the garden causeth the things that are sown to, in it to spring forth. So the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Now notice that God is going to cause that to happen. He is going to, to, to bring the, the fruits of righteousness out. Now, has God ever attempted a thing 
that wasn't accomplished. Absolutely not. Never, ever, ever has he failed us. Never did he set out and it wasn't accomplished. So if his goal is righteousness in us, that joy, it's going to come to fruitation. Or you've never had what you said to start with. You see what I'm saying? Because God, uh, God can't not be successful. Does that make sense? He's always successful. He always wins. He's always righteous. Look for the joy. Look for the joy.